the Marxian theory again influenced and conditioned both in neo-Marxian direction and in the direction of elite theory. The neo-Marxian direction would actually be in continuation with the fundamentals of Marxism, but in the writings of Gramsci and Althusser, culture became increasingly recognized as a very important factor, something allegedly Marx actually attributed no power at all. Much more interesting in the context of the Marxian theory would be the rise of the elite theory, particularly through the writings of Wilfredo Pareto. It is reported that Pareto's theory or elite theory attracted the European fascists between the two world wars. That would mean that this particular theory stood apart from the Marxian theory in terms of its political mission. The basic position in elite theory is this, that any society is split into two halves, the elite and the masses. This almost replicates the Marxian description of the two principal classes. Pareto takes the foundation of this stratification away from economic class as in Marxian understanding. Those who would be superior in terms of any vital skill would be an elite. That would mean that in any society, institution to institution, there would be separate elites. For example, there can be a cultural elite or an economic elite or a political elite or to refer to Mosca's term a governing elite. That would mean that any political society would be composite of many elites. But again with the recurring argument that to be elite in politics would probably facilitate somebody to become elite in culture and vice versa. So to say mutually invigorating positions, the positions at the top. Two kinds of men would govern metaphorically, the lions who use their strength and the foxes who use their cunning in order to be keep people in subjection. In subjection would be the masses forever disorganized, unlike Marxist laboring class who develop an organization, particularly a political party. So, these masses in elite theory are doomed to be the subject masses forever because the elite position would never go to the masses except occasionally and it will circulate between the lions and the foxes. This is normally taken to be a very cynical conception of power because it argues that power is always dichotomically divided between the elites and the masses. The elite theory had its day, right? And in the next major movement toward theoretical formulation, we normally talk about the postmodernist, post-structuralist contribution in understanding of power and theory. And the scholar who stands out is Michel Foucault. I must tell you that if one reads Michel Foucault, one would discover traces of earlier theoretical understanding of power. It is like 
to use the much used analogy, the old wine in the new bottle. The bottle is new in terms of a set of new arguments and a set of new concepts. To repeat and remind, one can find at least faint formations of these arguments and concepts in the pre-existing political theory on power and authority. But Michel Foucault is Michel Foucault in the sense that he has argued and powerfully through a large number of very important works how power operates, particularly under conditions of modernity. A reference to Foucault is unavoidable because it is from Foucault we learned and in a very assertive manner something I began with that power and authority do not reside in the state only, that power and authority do not have only one single operative mode and that power and authority always go unchallenged. Foucault sort of formalized a whole new political theory in which new concepts like governmentality, panopticon crop up, the notion of subjectification and desubjectification also. So, we will go into Foucault. Somebody who has sat through all the lectures and would manage to the folds of argument might at the end after listening to Michel Foucault announce that learning Michel Foucault would have been enough from where we could derive the liberal theoretical position, the Marxist position or for that matter the elitist position. This is what I meant by dialectical cumulative growth in theoretical thinking in all the sciences, natural or social, such is the nature of knowledge. We talk about the nature of knowledge particularly because in Foucault's case, knowledge became a principal referent. He has a title which reads power slash knowledge. This slash would mean that power and knowledge are interchangeable expressions. I suggested that traces of this line of thinking can be found in earlier understanding also. Let me give an example. Durkheim offered a concept he called collective conscience. He argues that each people have a set of shared ideas, attitudes and valuations by which they go by. So much so, he argues that collective concerns have a firm stranglehold over the minds of people. That collective conscience becomes cultural capital in Bordeaux's writing and Foucault takes over also as the principal role knowledge plays. This shift to knowledge is a major shift. It is a shift away from use of bodily punishment or threat of death. And Foucault argues and on reflection you will also concede that this is more cunning in the sense that I imprison you, that is one way of dealing with dissidents. And there is another way of corrupting your mind altogether, that is depriving you of autonomy of thinking. A scholar called 
Noam Chomsky became famous writing a book called Manufacturing of Consent. This actually strikes at the heart of liberal theory in which consent is projected as voluntary. Chomsky argues consent is not voluntary, consent is manufactured and Foucault would add that consent is manufactured in so many devious ways and without most of the time recoursing to physical punishments. That is a major shift. To go back to Althusser, how ideological apparatus plays a much greater role than the repressive apparatus. And that is why, that is why Foucault is rated to be a very good student of modern and postmodern conditions. But please do not make the mistake that prisons have disappeared. Foucault was not telling this. Foucault was telling prisons are becoming normal institutions. Nobody is against prisons any longer. But far more important would be Foucault's pointer that there are non-prisons which operate like prisons. See, let me point out the structure of a prison which came to be known as panopticon. That would be a particular architecture where the subjected people can always be under surveillance by somebody, while the subjected people have a no chance to find out who is actually watching them. This is one way something. You can't find him, but you know he is there. Even if he is not there actually, you have no way to find out that he is not there. You are, you are always under control. The, the modern surveillance camera, the hidden camera would be a good example when many people are watched at the same time by let us say only one individual and you have the mechanism of footage which means you can go back and find out who was actually reveling in a particular prison setup. To get back to remind you, Michel Foucault says non-prisons can be constituted like prisons and where everybody is under surveillance. And if you give a thought, you must have discovered this is indeed true for the locality, for the university campus, for let us say a cultural complex like Nondon. Wherever you go, you will find that some people are watching other persons and most of the time surreptitiously. Foucault calls it invisible control. You can see a policeman attired in a dress. You can see a police van. It has a particular structure. You know a, how a prison looks, they are visible. What is visible can be avoided, can be negotiated. But what is invisible is not amenable to negotiation and knowledge is one such unit which is not visible and not amenable to negotiation. That explains why Foucault puts a slash between power and knowledge and argues that modern power operates through manipulation of knowledge. This is a very striking contribution. Then he proceeds to point out that this power can be found anywhere and everywhere. You know, up till Foucault, the suggestion was true. It can be found anywhere and everywhere. But Foucault for the first time tried to argue that this anywhere and everywhere are actually connected. It is part of the system. If my father is watching and if the local master is watching, if my prime minister is watching, all are watching and with the same purpose. May not this boy turn rebellious, may forever he remain particularly conformist. You know, this is part of what actually incites genetical engineering or cloning of men and women 
that if you can clone only conformists, then you will no longer have any dissidence and that you can do with the help of the sciences, medicine and Foucault has a found place for medicine, how medicine is actually exploited by the state in order to control people when they do not know how to control people. Our whole suspicion about the other identity card in India is based on that. That if a private company knows my whereabouts, then could it turn against me at a particular point of time? Can it sell those informal reports on me to somebody who is interested in controlling us? So the India even actually poised towards the Foucauldian kind of society where you have increasing amount of surveillance and through various amounts of means. This is where Foucault stands apart. New forms, new sites, new ways of power. Most of them invisible, most of them unaccountable and where knowledge is the central resource. We all know that media are involved in dissemination of knowledge. But on second thought, you may concede that media is involved in production of knowledge. And I trust my newspaper, read the headlines, think about Indian state, accept the legitimacy and we say it is okay. See, this is the everyday manipulation of my consciousness and conscience which is so clever and so well deployed that nobody can escape. You must have noticed that brilliant minds serve either corporate houses or bureaucracy, they are not found in the academia because the brilliant minds are paid better and they enjoy status. So the state and the industry can appropriate the brilliant minds and they produce brilliant solutions to the problem of rebellion. This is how Foucault argue that modern society proceeds through basically manipulation to knowledge. This man Foucault introduces also the notion of biopower. It means power over the body. But then up to Foucault, the power over the body was capital punishment. If you are disobedient, you are sent to prison. If you are disobedient, you are burned at the stakes or you are sent to the gallows. Today, the state no longer holds out threat. You must have noticed all over the world, there is an argument against capital punishment because state knows that it can still be powerful without capital punishment. That would mean that the place of capital punishment has been taken over by something else and according to Foucault, manipulated knowledge. You look how the game changes to more subtlety, more invisibility and more non-accountability and that way it hollows out even liberal democracy. So much so, we talk about today the authoritarian liberal democracy. You have everything, a constitution, citizens' rights, global watchdog, civil society, everything is vibrant. But then basically, you know, what happens is this, they actually correspond to the requirements of a particular order of things. And that Foucault says is secured by knowledge. Foucault has another conceptual contribution called governmentality, which he says is the uniquely modern combination of governance through discipline and in which knowledge takes a part. If you stop for a moment and look around you, you must have seen that instruments for dissemination of knowledge has proliferated like anything. For example, when I was a student, there was no notion of open university. There is nothing called long distance education. There is nothing called 
the photocopy machine, there was nothing called or it has just emerged the paperback edition. Okay. That would mean that it is in the interest of the system of power to actually disseminate knowledge because knowledge can actually sort of seduce individuals into conformity. And in Foucault's language, seduction also comes how the state or those in power of state seduce people into believing that whatever they are doing, they are doing for the well-being of the citizens themselves. This is how it wins. Secondly, it actually employs a wide range of technology to control the body of the individual and far more important in Foucault's understanding the psyche of the individual. Let me give an example of consumerism. You know, consumerism is actually in Foucauldian understanding a ploy to engage men in consumption, sometimes mindless consumption, so that they would be away from more fundamental questions affecting their freedom. This is very vital. And you know, there is one question which is raised repeatedly. When, why in China the party is not overthrown? And then somebody would argue, look at the average Chinese longevity, the Chinese body, the number of gold medals China wins, any athletic mill, look at the members who gathered for the last concluded Chinese Communist Party Congress, they are so beautiful looking, gorgeously dressed, right? So the argument runs that if they get the essentials of life, then who bothers for freedom, right? And Michel, Fou Michel Foucault would say, this is the trump of the system to make freedom a non-issue. And most of the time we retain the facade of freedom but we actually empty the facade of real freedom because I am always directed by the other, by the market, by the academia, by the media, by the state, by the global civil society, in any particular sphere, from fashion to Foucault. Everybody now comes as a part of a whole package. And I have already mentioned that much of the control takes place when we do not detect that a control is actually being exercised over us. This Foucault calls multifaceted subjectification, which means we, we are subjects in all collective spheres. Okay. But then he also points out an with historical instances that excess of subjectification sets into motion what he calls desubjectification, where people are no longer willing to become subject. Let us hurry back to a man called Thomas Hobbes. Thomas Hobbes wanted the state to be absolute, but he made one concession. If the state would rob the life of an individual, the individual would have right to rebellion. And from Hobbes onwards, whoever has talked about the power of the state has considered in the margins of their philosophy that the citizens can also react sometimes violently against the state which is excessively authoritarian. But in Foucault's case, the explanation changes. Which means, I do not confront a policeman, I bypass a policeman. Because if I confront a policeman, I know for certain that he has a superior gunpowder and he would kill me. But I can set up a ploy actually to bypass a policeman. This has now become known famous after Foucault, how not to be governed. And we find out how not to be governed and thereby find out a particular space for our freedom called freedom in the cracks, not on the main wall, but in the cracks of the wall we discover freedom and that is how we actually desubjectify or reduce the enormity of control directed towards us by the state power or any kind of power over 
us. That way, from Hobbes to Foucault, one may think and one may argue and will argue, it has been actually a single run of thinking, how power changes depending on the contingencies of the time. The first block of lectures dealt with concepts. These concepts are embedded in these theories enunciated before you in the second set of lectures. So, concepts and theories, they combine to make the whole of the understanding in political science, the nature of power and authority.